I'm reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 24, starting with verse 35. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also were the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, and the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not expect. And I'm reading now from chapter 25, beginning with verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to go by, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins called came also saying, Lord, Lord, open up to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. The big question that we're going to discuss tonight is, are you ready? Are you ready for Jesus to come back? Are you ready for the work that God has set before us? Are you ready to do what it takes to reach people who are lost? Are you ready to bring hope to the hopeless? Are you ready for whatever God brings? Many Christians will stand up and say, amen, yes. But when you look at their lives, you notice that they aren't ready. You need to understand that Christianity is not a Sunday thing or a Tuesday night thing. It's an every single day thing. You can't say that I'm ready for Jesus to return on Sunday and then not living for him every day of the week. People are foolish. The Bible tells us that God won't be mocked. Now here's the sermon in one sentence. You take anything away from the sermon, let it be this. The way we view the future determines the way we live our lives in the present. If we aren't looking forward to Jesus' return, we won't be living like it today. If we're looking forward to next week's bills, we won't be saving today for it. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 37 says, But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. So Jesus is telling us what? Like the days of Noah, when Jesus comes back, the world will be like the days of Noah. Okay. So let's think about some of the things that were going on. The population was growing. Genesis 6, verse 1. Sexual perversion. Genesis 6, verse 2. Demonic activity. Genesis 6, verse 2. Constant evil in the heart of man. Genesis 6, verse 5 and violence and corruption around the world. Genesis 6, verse 11. We see all of this happening today, and it shows us that Jesus is coming back soon. Are you ready? 
Are you ready for that? If not, you need to get ready because if you're just acting the part to make people happy, you will not see heaven. Are you ready for the Lord's return? I'm reading now from Luke chapter 12, beginning with verse 35. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Some of the things that Jesus is telling us. Remember when the first one, you know what he tells us? He says, stay dressed for action. Back in the ancient days, they would wear these long robes, right? We all know that wearing a long robe or a dress makes it very hard to run or move quickly. So in order to run or move quickly, you would have to tuck the bottom of the robe up into your girdle. Now, so the idea here is that you're always prepared for the master. You were always ready for his return. Number two, keep your lamp burning. Again, in the ancient days, obviously they didn't have electricity, right? So if you were expecting a visitor, you would keep your lamp lit all night. You're staying ready. Number three, the master could be coming back from a feast or a wedding feast. This is the third picture Jesus gives us. Back in his day, they knew how to throw parties. They would have a feast and it would last a week. Feast for a week. Praise the Lord. We see that the master could come back at midnight so the servants would have to be ready to open the door and serve their master. And number four, the thief coming. This is the fourth picture that Jesus gives us. If the homeowner would have known that the thief was coming, then he would not have let the thief break in. And then he tells us, you must be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not know. Now, the idea of being ready should bring this question to mind. How can I be ready for Jesus' is coming? Right? Well, thank you for asking. Number one. Jesus has to be your Lord. This seems a very obvious statement, but you never know. You can't say Jesus is your Savior and not my Lord. And people are thinking, I've never said that. We never say that out loud. Instead, we let our actions speak for us. You see, we have the Word of God. We have His Word for us today. We know what Jesus requires and desires of his people. When we know what he wants, but we don't do that, Jesus is not the Lord of our life. Instead, he's just another person in our life. You see, the Lord is someone with authority, control, and has power over others. The Lord is your master slash ruler. And I got four thoughts about that. Let me give you my first thought. If Jesus is our Lord, we will live like it. Second thought, if he is your Lord, you will obey his word. Third thought, if he is your Lord, you will spend time with him. And my fourth thought, if he is your Lord, you will seek his will and not your own. The question we all need to ask ourselves is, am I allowing Jesus to be the Lord of my life? Or am I my own Lord? And don't get me wrong, he doesn't need your permission. One day, everyone will submit to the truth that Jesus is Lord. And if you're not surrendering to him, then there will come a time when he will do what has to be done in order for you to get to your knees and surrender. God will get your attention one way 
or another. It's just easier when you choose to surrender as Jesus, as Lord, in order to be ready for Christ's return. He has to be the Lord of your life. Number two, to be ready for Jesus, you must be his servant. Since Jesus is Lord, that automatically means that we are his servants. I'm reading from Mark chapter 9 and verse 35. And he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. And I'm reading from John chapter 15, verse 12 and 13. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. All Christians are called to be servants. But at times it seems like people don't want to serve. Instead, they want to be served. Yeah. In order to be ready for Jesus, we must be the servants. Remember what it says in verse 37. He says, that blessed are those servants. So my question is again, are you a servant of God or are you a servant of the world? This is the question that has to be answered. God is giving people gifts and those gifts should be used to serve Him, the church, and people in general. I'm reading now from 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Amen? Okay. I believe that if we're not being servants, then we don't have a good understanding of who Jesus is. Because Jesus is the chief servant. He gave us an example of how we should live, right? So what does the servant look like? Or what are some of the requirements? Because the Bible tells us what a servant looks like, don't it? Right? First of all, they number one, they continue in faith. Number two, they destroy arguments and every loft opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Number three, they take every thought captive to obey Christ. And that's taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. They pursue holy living. That's from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14, 15, and 16. They daily crucify the lust of the flesh. Romans 6, verses 1 through 6. They love their brothers and sisters in the faith. 1 John 3. Verse 14 and 15. They store treasure in heaven. Matthew 6, verse 19 and verse 20. And they eagerly await the Master's return. And that is in Revelation 22, verse 20. So when we do things for others, when we do things for the church, we do it humbly and selflessly. Because everything we should do should be done to please our God and bring Him glory. Jesus tells us, I'm back in Luke again, chapter 17 and verse 10. So likewise you, when you have done all those things which are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Is Jesus our master, or is he just our homie? You see, if he's our master, then our lives should portray that. The way you live should show it. If he's your homie, well, it, it's noticeable because your life looks just like the world. Number three, to be ready for Jesus, you have to live with the expectation of his return. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert. When we invite people over for a party or a dinner, what do we do? We clean our house, right? We put on our nice clothes, right? We shower. And sometimes when someone has very important people over, they tend to act differently. 
if we're expecting the king, if we're expecting our savior, if we're expecting the son of God, how should my life look? I believe that Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 16, tells us exactly how we should live that life. So I'm going to Galatians. And I'm going to read to you. Galatians 5, beginning with verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I told you beforehand, just as I had told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. We should be walking in the Spirit daily. If we want to be found ready, because now because of some people who don't know Jesus, they give the true believers a bad name. And why would anyone want the saving grace and knowledge of Jesus if you're living just like them? Why would anyone need a Savior if we're over here doing the same thing that they are? When we truly surrender to Jesus, when we walk in the Spirit, when we are producing these fruits every day, then we will be ready when Jesus comes back. But not only that, we will also be a light to all those who are lost in darkness. Let me tell you something. We want to be ready for Jesus coming, but we also want to bring as many people as we can with us. It's our job to stand at the gates of hell and turn people away, telling them there is a better way. Charles Spurgeon said, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped around their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions and that no one go unwarned and unprayed for. Let us be found ready for the return of Jesus. And at the same time, let us bring hope to a hopeless world. You see, people right now are dying without hope. What are you doing about it? God is going to do something great. Are you ready for it? As a church, are we ready for God to do a mighty work? If not, you need to get ready because you don't want to be left out of it. Why should we be ready for his return? Because he will be judging us based on what we've been given. Turn with me back now to Luke again. This is Luke chapter 12. And I'm reading, beginning with verse 42. And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise servant, steward, who his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. The servants will be rewarded because they lived every second as if the master was coming that day. Also, they were good stewards of what the master put them over. 
Okay, now let's go back to 45 and 46. But if that servant says in his heart, my master's delaying his coming, and begins to beat the male and female servants, and to eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him, and in an hour when he's not aware, and will cut him in two, and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. If the servant is not faithful over his work, you see, they thought, <laughs> they thought they had enough time. So they lived for their own pleasure and abused others. And this is the worst punishment. This is terrifying, especially for those leaders who build churches for their own gain instead of preaching the word faithfully. Their punishment shows that they were never truly repentant. Please, 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 don't be this servant. Don't sit in church, hear the word, and do nothing. Don't just play games. God will not be mocked. Verse 47. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. People will be punished severely because they knew the master was coming, but they didn't do anything to prepare themselves. Warning. To hear the truth proclaimed every church, in our church, every Sunday and every Tuesday and go out and ignore the truth the rest of the week is a risky way to live. What if the master comes this week? How can people sit here and listen to this long sermon but not change how they live tomorrow? So many of us are at fault with this. We need to repent and to be ready for his coming. Verse 48. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, for him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. You see, these servants had no idea what was going on, so they just received a light punishment. Why? Because if you're entrusted with much, even more will be expected. Remember what Uncle Ben said from Spider-Man? With great power comes what? Great responsibility. With great knowledge of what is expected of us, the greater the responsibility that we have. I believe the people in this church have no excuse because we know what God requires of us. We teach the Bible. We teach what God wants of us. And at the same time, we should be reading our word in our own time and drawing closer to him. People will be quite shocked when Jesus comes back and they aren't found ready because they are too busy living for themselves or for some dumb cause. Instead of living for the one who can fix all things. You know, I'd like to share a story. I think it will help you to understand the reason why I believe there are people who think they are born again. And there are people who are born again who are looking for the return of Christ. Two men are seated on a plane. The first is given a parachute and told to put it on. As if, and told it would improve his flight. He's a little skeptical at first since he can't see how wearing a parachute on a plane could possibly improve his flight. He decides to experiment and see if the claims are true. As he puts it on, he notices the weight of it upon his shoulders. And he finds it difficult sitting upright. However, he consoles himself with the fact that he was told that the parachute would improve his flight. So he decides to wait a little bit, get a little time. And as he waits, he notices that some of the other passengers are laughing at him for wearing a parachute on the plane. He begins to feel somewhat humiliated. As they continue to point and laugh at him, he can stand it no longer. He slinks into his seat, unstraps the parachute, and he throws it on the floor. Disillusionment and bitterness fills his heart because as far as he was concerned, he was told an outright lie. Now let's analyze the motive and the result of each passenger's experience. The first man's motive for putting the parachute on was solely to what? Improve his flight. The result of his experience was that he was humiliated, 
by the passengers, disillusioned and somewhat embittered against those who gave him the parachute. As far as he's concerned, it'll be a long time before anyone gets one of those things on my back again. The second man is given a parachute. But listen to what he's told. He's told to put it on because at any moment you'll be jumping at 25,000 feet out of the plane. He gratefully puts on the parachute. He doesn't notice the weight of it on his shoulders, nor that he can't sit upright. His mind is consumed with the thought of what would happen to him if he jumped without the parachute. The second man puts the parachute on solely to escape the jumps to come. And because of his knowledge of what would happen to him if he jumped without it, he has deep rooted joy and peace in his heart because he knows he is saved from sure death. This knowledge gives him the ability to withstand the mockery of the other passengers. His attitude toward those who gave him the parachute is one of heartfelt gratitude. You know what the modern gospel says? Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and he'll give you love, joy, Peace, fulfillment, and lasting happiness. In other words, Jesus will improve your flight. The sinner responds in an experimental fashion, puts on the Savior to see if the claims are true. And what does he get? The promised temptation, tribulation, persecution. The other passengers mock him. So what did he do? He takes off the Lord Jesus. He's offended for the word's sake. He's disillusioned and somewhat embittered. Quite rightly so. He was promised peace, joy, love, fulfillment. I only got trials and humiliation. His bitterness is directed to those who gave him the so-called good news. I am not preaching Jesus improves the flight. I'm warning sinners that they are going to have to jump out of the plane. That it's pointed for man to die once and then face the judgment. That's what Hebrews 9 verse 27 says. You must understand the horrific consequences of breaking the law of God. And you need to flee to God, to the Savior, to escape the wrath that is going to come. God commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Acts 17, verse 30 and verse 31. The issue isn't one of life enhancement, but of righteousness. You see, it doesn't matter how happy a sinner is or how much he's enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season. Without the righteousness of Christ, he will perish on the day of wrath. Proverbs 11.4 says, Riches profit not on the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Can you remember why the second passenger had joy and peace in his heart? It was because he knew that the parachute was going to save him from sure death. And in the same way, Believers, we have joy and peace in believing. That's from Romans chapter 15 and verse 13. Because we know that the righteousness of Christ is going to deliver us from the wrath to come. Now, what I want you to do, I want you to bow your heads. If you're wearing a hat, take it off in honor to God. I know there's people in this room right now who says, Pastor David, I'm not exactly sure why you told us this long story about two passengers, both of them taking a ride on a plane. I'm here to explain that to you for those of you that don't understand. There are people who think Jesus is here to give you comfort and to give you only what you want. And you've been coming for those things. But the reality is you know he's not the Lord and Savior of your life. You know that you know. I don't have to tell you that. You know. So while everyone's head is bowed, and we're going to pray. Because if you're one of those people and you say, Pastor David, for the first time I see myself as a sinner. 
for the first time, Father, I recognize that I have sinned against a holy God, that his laws are holy, and not only are they holy, but Father God, I'm not ready. I'm not ready if Jesus were to come this evening, if he were to come tomorrow morning, I'm not ready. But I want to be ready right now. I want to get right with God because... I want Jesus to become my Savior and Lord. If that's you, I want you to get up out of your seat right now and come forward. Right now. Right now. You know whether you are or you aren't right with God. Get out of this seat and come up here right now. Give them applause. Give them whatever they need to hear. But you need to give them the ability to come up here. Come up here right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. There's no more playing, church. Now, I need a man behind each one of these people that are up here right now. Behind every one of these men that are here right now, they need you to hear, but we're going to pray for them. Do you understand? Pray with me. Dear Jesus, I admit to you that I am a sinner, and I need your grace. I know, Father God, that you took my sin into Jesus' body. That when they crucified him, all my sin was taken away. Now, Lord, I know on the third day they raised you from the dead. Lord, I want to be ready for your return. Jesus, become the Lord and Savior of my life. Take complete control. From this day forward, I will be a servant. I will obey your word. And I will walk the walk you've asked me to walk. I am going to walk in the Spirit and serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God. Now, for those of you, I'll ask you again, are you ready for Christ's return? Are you ready? Stay ready. Stay in the Word. Stay in prayer. Stay serving. Stay living for Him so that you will always be found what? Ready. Amen? God bless you. For those of you who are watching online, God bless you. If you made a commitment to Christ, please make sure that you put it in the chat box that I gave my heart to Christ, and he is now my Lord and Savior. God bless you.